My group continues to work their way through out of the abyss, and they're going to Blingdenstone next, so I needed to whip up some quick terrain. Along the way, I tried out a new approach to presenting it at the table, discovered some new paint colors and schemes that I really like, learned more about Svrfneblin than I'll ever care to talk about, got me a full collection of the complete menagerie of classic oozes, dusted off and revisited some old tricks I haven't used in years, flocked with crystals, I can literally say that I've done that now, and generally just had fun crafting for me as I got ready for the battle for Blingden Stone. Hello everyone, Wylock here. Thank you for joining me. Got some prerequisite viewing for you today. If you haven't heard of Dungeon Craft on YouTube, Professor Dungeon Master Dan gives us Ultimate Dungeon Terrain. Something I had never thought about trying until now. I've tried out lots of other YouTuber systems. I'm just curious. Spoiler alert, it's a cool approach. I like it. And I'm going to use this circular platter with the Lazy Susan a lot in the future. So, I finally got around to building my own UDT platter. I painted it up exactly as he described. So, good video, cards on the screen, go and check that out. And then we can get on with building Blingden Stone. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. Let's read this excerpt from Out of the Abyss to get an idea for what Blingden Stone sort of looks like. You leave the dark tunnel behind and step into what looks like another world. Not harsh caverns, but a subterranean land of warm colors and welcoming smells. Inner Blingdenstone general features. Chambers, so the city is not a single cavern, but a network of many interconnected caves and pockets. And it's rare for cavern walls to be bare in Blingdenstone. The walls of large caverns are studded with stairs and ramps, leading to balconies and hollows serving as storage or shops. That sentence right there is what I'm really going to key in on and what you'll see come out in the design. Also, some are crisscrossed by walkways, allowing Sverf Neblin and visitors to reach connecting tunnels high above the floor. Love it. Verticality, I'll be able to easily make some planks and have miniatures up high. Also, among the things lighting the cavern are caged giant fire beetles. So I'm definitely making those. And the deep gnomes and other small races can walk through tunnels with ease, medium or larger, must duck and squeeze. So all these ratways and pockets in the walls, I'm going to take that into account. This place sort of looks like Swiss cheese. And it is not worth it to build the entire map as it's laid out and out of the abyss. So I'm making a few scatter features that I can lay out and move around to abstract and represent any given area that the party's in, in the city. To do that, I'm rocking the Proxen hot wire with some 2 inch thick polystyrene. I cut some chunks that are six inches wide and as tall as they'll go in the cutter. And then I ran it through like this vertically and sort of wobbled it around to give it a smooth cavernous look. With a different paint job, I think this would actually make for good glaciers or something like that. I'll experiment in the future. First up, hardening it with Mod Podge. Just a straight coat, undiluted. I don't like to mix it with paint or water or any other additives. I don't like to dilute the strength of the Mod Podge. It's a primer and a sealant for me, and I've just had good success doing it this way. So after that dries, and then giving it a black base coat, first I dry brush with a beige color. Easy enough. And it's the same beige that I used for my UDT platter. Likewise, a lighter dry brush to highlight with a lighter beige color. Again, the same one I used for the UDT platter. And continuing in that theme, these get a wash with black. This is like 10 parts water to one part black acrylic craft paint. Dries in about 15 minutes. But while it is drying, we're gonna work on the wood. Now lately I've been doing wood a totally different way. I've got this color from folk art called Asphaltum. Asphaltum? Hardly knew him. I'll show myself out. Anyway, with my craft wood products like popsicle sticks, wooden dowels, that sort of thing, I put on a diluted bit of this. It's not a wash, but it's just kind of watered down. Gets just one coat, not two, and it will look a bit orangey, which maybe you like. And in certain settings, I will just leave it at that, but we're going to come back to it later. Now the walls are studded with platforms and ramps and stuff. This is a mining community, right? So I gouge out the holes first, inject them with hot glue, and then stick in the, the pole or the plank or whatever it is that I'm attaching. A uh, little tip, 
Before you do ramps, make sure that your miniatures can stand on them. Here I am making a platform that juts out pretty far, connecting it underneath, and you'll see this one later in the summary. But mix it up, make no two alike. Put some steps, put some ramps, put some platforms, make it look chaotic. Now for those crawlways, those small tunnels, I'm using cereal box cardstock. Just cutting out a small, you know, the shape of the entrance to the sub cave, hot gluing it on and basing it in black. Around the perimeter, I apply a heavy bead of white PVA glue and then chunk on some small pebbles. Just throw them on there, stick them down, dump off the excess, ah, instant gratification. Oh yeah. Earlier we talked about caged fire beetles, so look at this. This is a hair curler from the dollar store. It was a dollar for like a pack of 20. So I cut this down, put on a bottom, like with, okay, so I use chipboard, I don't even remember. I think I put a washer on there too. And then it gets primed and painted with gunmetal. And then these miniatures, which I printed on my Anycubic Photon Mono, excellent printer, painted them up, fits right in there, can put it wherever. So this provides the light in blinged in stone. Now I can feel it. I, can f I, I know that you're sitting there and I can feel it coming from you. Why didn't you use LEDs? It's a perfect opportunity to use LEDs. You could replace the thorax of the models with an LED and use a battery on the bottom or something, right? Or hide it in the top of the cage. Well, I did try. I went through lots of permutations and it just wasn't working. And then I realized, you know, this is for one gaming session, maybe two. I'm not going to put all this effort into a bespoke piece uh, for a specific setting, caged fire beetles. I'm unlikely to ever need to use that again, so I did not do LEDs. Hey, those crawlway perimeters have cured now, it's been about four hours, so I'm going to go back in with that black wash that I used earlier and just hit these to tone them down a little bit, blend them in with the rest of the wall. And now it's time to revisit all of the wood. Those of you familiar with GW products, Agrax Earthshade is excellent to use for this next step, but I'm assuming most of you may not have that or don't want to spend that money. So this is raw umber. I've mixed it with water. It looks very milky and light when it's wet, but water it down heavily, put it over all the wood that's already been given that asphaltum color, and when it dries, you get a beautiful, rich wood. No need to texture or anything because it's already wood. You're effectively just staining it with acrylic craft paint. This is a bag of crystals I bought a few years ago and have been dying to use. So imagining the deep gnomes as they carved out and they hewn out the city of Blingdenstone, they exposed veins of crystal that are deep underground. So this is those. I hot glued them on. Some of them I gouge into the wall so that they're like clearly protruding out and others are literally like an exposed vein. Here's a puddle of hot glue, and I'm gonna dump on a bunch of crystals and flock with them. Yeah. Again, mix it up, make it random. Now at the end of the chapter in Out of the Abyss is the battle for Blingdenstone, and there's this table that describes the possible encounters as the party makes their way to the Pudding King. So I made enough miniatures to be prepared for any combination of those table outcomes. This is a clear Lexen polycarbon sheet. This is not plexiglass, it behaves differently. It's easier to cut as well. So I scored it lightly to see if it would bend and it does. So I know that this is gonna be somehow the gelatinous cube. I scored out a grid of two inch lines and then with a Tetris piece here, just fitted it together into a cube, secured it with hot glue on the inside, and then textured the outside. This is a trick as old as time. And of course you leave the bottom off so that you literally can go and subsume the miniature of the creature that it has engulfed. Nice. Don't tint it green. Gelatinous cubes are not green, they are clear. Ochre jellies, they are large, so they're on a large base. Vinyl coated paper clips, super gluing those down, and these are the armature for the tendrils, blobs of hot glue, and these hemispherical beads. Easy, prime it and paint it, done. Gray ooze, I've done these three or four times now on this channel, but for completeness, I'll do it again. Got an old GW Slotta base here, and I'm using my Surebonder. Surebonder. Yes, my Surebonder Silver Hot Glue. 
It is so shimmery and reflective that the camera's having a hard time focusing here. Awesome stuff. Blingdon Stone is a center of commerce between the surface world and the Underdark, so it makes sense to have lots of sacks and crates and stuff, so whip up some quick scatter terrain. Crates. Easy. I bought some wood cubes. I'm going to paint them up to look like crates. Storage sacks. These are glass beads, and they're the smaller kind. I'm going to use these, plus some crafting string or twine, whatever, and some paper towel. And here's how it's done. First, with some brown paint, I'm going to colorize the rope, because if we just khakiify everything, it's just going to be khaki overload. Now, here's a bit of paper towel, and basically, we're going to wrap up this glass bead. It gives the shape and the weight. So I mix up some white glue and beige paint, just set it in there, and then bunch it up around the glass bead and sort of give it a little bit of a twist. I want to let this play for a moment so you can just see how it's done. Yeah, and then the rope gets cinched around that. Just a single, you, you can do a double knot, but I have found that a single knot is perfectly fine. It's not gonna go anywhere, even after you cut off the excess rope. So once that's done, I got my big kitchen shears here, cutting off the excess paper towel, and there we go. Little touch up with more of that beige and white glue, but this storage sack is done. So here in front are some shield dwarves from the Emerald Enclave who have joined the party. And look at the filth coming down this corridor. All I've done is use my wall pieces backwards. So anywhere that's not a cavern or a storeroom, that's a hallway, just turn them around. And like the text says, we have some crisscrossing walkways up high. Here's the Pudding King, who I've painted in all the colors of my oozes. It's a nasty little bugger. Like, truly nasty. And we have a couple glamour shots here of this battle. Now, maybe this is what it looks like to you. Um, I think the book has it take place in a defiled temple, but uh, whatever. Maybe the Pudding King marched with his army because the players didn't act in time. Now here is yet another setup with all this scatter terrain. All of them in a big arc making one big cavern for the final showdown. And the Pudding King, somehow, somehow that model stays on the ramp. I, I don't know. And as always, you gotta love that gimmick of a functional gelatinous cube. You'll also notice that I have some smaller ochre jellies and black puddings. I actually have two smaller sizes, a medium and a small, because those can split when they take the right amount of damage. And I wanted to have the right minis on hand to represent that happening with good visual fidelity. And here's just a view from the Pudding King's Vantage. The players would be coming in from abstracted, from a corridor or another room from over there, wherever it may be. That's part of the whole mantra, the whole idea behind Ultimate Dungeon Terrain. Again, go and watch Dungeon Craft. And finally, let's return to that scene you saw at the very beginning of this video. This I imagined as the main entry, like the Welcome Cavern. Lots of commerce going on, lots of Swerf Neblin going about their business. Got the caged fire beetles helping to provide light. And look, I even have one hanging on the wall. Again, make each wall segment look different. It's gonna be more interesting to the eye. Your players will feed off of it. They might get ideas, you might get ideas. Let the terrain itself help drive the story as opposed to the other way around. I forgot to mention earlier, the black puddings, I just bought the model and 3D printed it. Got impatient, but there's a lot of good tutorials on YouTube for how to scratch craft a black pudding. Total build time for the walls, about six hours. For the platter, about six hours. And for the miniatures, four hours. But that included brainstorming, first time experiments, and filming. Well, thanks for joining me today. And even if you're not building Blingdon Stone, hopefully you got some ideas about how to use Ultimate Dungeon Terrain by Dungeon Craft. Uh, these modular six inch wall sections, how you can set up and abstract your space or even some of the color schemes. I love this new wood technique that I've come upon. So keep on making things and playing games. I'm Wylock. I'll see you next time.